Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Today on Spotlight, the story of the Eats Bridge and why many were leery of the steel used to build it. Plus, Mizzou's vet school's medicine lab could lead to better treatments for both cat and human heart disease. And then a U-City grad talks about his Walt Disney animation career as the visual effects supervisor. But first, preserving black cowboy history that's been left out of mainstream American history. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. The Rodeo, an exhibition of cattle ranching that dates back to the 1850s in America. It's a dangerous sport where man and beast compete head to head with no fear. With all the excitement, glamour, and patriotism, the rodeo could not be a rodeo without the cowboy. Oh yeah, we got some tough cowboys. Not all of them are tough men. The ladies are tough too. There's a lot of crashes sometimes. I'm a little bruised, but I think I'll be all right. She really wanted to run, and I wasn't ready for her to run as fast yet. So I guess while I jerked it back, she just wanted to flip up and flip over. Yes, I was not going to let that go to waste. I wanted to ride again. But it's really good watching. Nobody really gets hurt. It's the Southeastern Rodeo Association. You can bring your eight-year-old daughter and your 80-year-old mother-in-law and will not be offended. They'll all have a good time. It's, it's one of the last true forms of family entertainment. Family entertainment with a twist. The purpose of the Southeast Royal Association is to preserve the heritage of the black cowboy. The Southeastern Rodeo Association assures that all Americans know that the black cowboy and girls still exist. They are performing, competing, and winning. The Southeastern Rodeo Association has numerous events in each rodeo. They have bronc riding, they have bull riding, they have steer wrestling, they have steer undecorating for women, calf roping, barrel racing. It's three cans, right, left, middle, the fastest time wins. Walter Hull is the rodeo's producer and a cowboy himself. He wants to try and do something to preserve the black cowboy. West depicts a homogeneous imagery with husky white men riding into the sunset with their bandanas tied around their neck and lassos swinging overhead. But the West was much to the contrary. The people that were taking care of the cattle were the African Americans and the Hispanic, the Mexican charros. Those were the people that really had the best skill with livestock. Their trade was dealing with cattle, herding cattle, nursing cattle, moving cattle, taking care of cattle. The Federation of Black Cowboys says during the glory days of the Western Frontier in the 1870s and 80s, 25% of an approximate 35,000 cowboys were black, a fact largely ignored by publications, history books, and Hollywood. When you watch TV, you see Roy Rogers and all those guys, but you never really see much about the black cowboy. So that's the one thing that a lot of people don't know. There's a lot of history on the black cowboy. Bass Reeves, a 19th century Arkansas runaway slave, became a legendary deputy U.S. Marshal. The six foot two mustachioed muscle man captured more than 3,000 criminals while in disguise to fool felons. His ace detective skills, super strength, and supreme horsemanship is believed to be the inspiration behind one of America's most beloved fictional characters, the Lone Ranger. Art Burton wrote a book about Bass Reeves. In his book, he points out similarities, such as their gray horses, the use of Native American trackers, me not understand, Kimusabi, and unusual calling cards. Reeves gave folks a silver dollar to remember him by, while the Lone Ranger left silver bullets. There'd probably not be steer wrestling in the American rodeo if it were not for a black cowboy from Texas. 
His name is Bill Pickett. And that event that he originated is called bulldogging or steer wrestling. Pickett stood five foot two and weighed 145 pounds. Many of the animals he wrestled outweighed him by 1,000 to 1,200 pounds. One time a steer broke away from the herd and he didn't have a rope with him. So he rode his horse as fast as he could, caught up with the steer, jumped off his horse, grabbed the steer, wrestling to the ground, bit his lip with his teeth, and fell back and threw the steer down where the other guys could come and get him. Pickett single-handedly pioneered the art of steer wrestling. He received sensational national and international publicity. During his career, he made two short film documentaries and traveled for many years performing with the famous 101 Ranch, a Wild West exhibition. Unfortunately, the lifestyle that made him famous ended his life. Pickett died from a traumatic brain injury after being kicked in the head by a horse. In 1971, he was inducted into the National Cowboy Hall of Fame. Most rodeo historians agree that no single performer contributed more to the complicated series of rodeo events than did Pickett with his bulldogging techniques. The black cowboy will always stay alive through the Southeastern Rodeo Association. The goal is to make sure that we drive and educate people on the importance of the black cowboy that helped tame the Old West. Every child should know their background. Every child should know what their ancestors brought to the table. Every child should be able to feel good about being whom they are. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hi, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell from the Missouri Historical Society, and this is History Spotlight. Completed in 1874, the Eads Bridge was the first bridge across the Mississippi River in St. Louis. Public historian Andrew Wonko tells us why engineers felt that building it was an impossible feat. In the years immediately following the American Civil War, St. Louis was growing at an unbelievably rapid pace. We were right in the middle of the country, situated on one of the biggest rivers in the continent. Uh, but St. Louis had a huge problem. That river that brought all of these goods to and from the city was also becoming this huge barrier as railroads were growing, as the new way things were transported around the country. All of the railroads connecting St. Louis to eastern cities had to stop on the Mississippi's banks, and all of those goods had to be ferried across one at a time to get them into St. Louis itself. This was a huge problem that was holding St. Louis back from becoming an even bigger city. St. Louis knew it needed a bridge across the Mississippi River, and the bridge that we got came from one of the most brilliant mechanical minds St. Louis has ever known. James Eads was no stranger to the Mississippi River. When he was 13 years old, he watched all of his family's belongings sink in a steamboat accident right off of the St. Louis levee. After that, he invented a diving bell that allowed him to go down and search for uh, steamboat wrecks on the bottom of the Mississippi. He built ironclad gunboats for the Union Army during the Civil War. His life was tied to the river. But in 1867, he got the commission to build the Mississippi River Bridge at St. Louis. Probably the most fascinating thing about it was that he was a man who had never built anything resembling a bridge any time in his life before, so he certainly knew what kind of stakes he was up against. The Eads Bridge was an engineering marvel like none that had come before. This bridge would leap across the Mississippi River on two piers that spanned 500 feet each. This was shocking and amazing, this length of distance that this bridge was going to be able to cover. But even more amazing was that Eads would use steel to do it. Steel in the 1860s was a metal that was still as much alchemy as science. People did not trust it. They really didn't know what kind of power it had. And when people looked at the plans for the Eads Bridge, this looked skeletal, it looked weak, people thought it was going to fall over just under its own weight. They had no idea what James Eads knew, how strong steel truly was, and what kind of incredible weight it could support. The Eads Bridge took from 1867 all the way to 1874 to build, and again was an engineering marvel unlike any other. 
When it finally did open, people were still very nervous about it, so James Eads knew a good PR stunt when he saw one. He actually walked a trained circus elephant across the bridge because the widespread belief at the time was that an elephant would not set foot on something that it knew was unstable. If that wasn't enough, at the bridge's opening, he parked 14 fully loaded locomotives on the bridge at the same time just to prove how unbelievably strong it truly was. It still stands 150 years later and is still one of the icons of the city of St. Louis. Next week on History Spotlight, why the aeronautic competition of the 1904 World's Fair didn't quite go as planned. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. Hugging, petting, and snuggling with a pet cat may have heart-healthy benefits. Several studies have shown that actually petting your cat, so probably taking the time to sit down, relax, pet your cat, take that moment of time out, actually helps to lower people's blood pressures. Will certainly add to our heart health. University of Missouri feline geneticist Leslie Lyons can't say for sure, though, if there are heart-healthy benefits for cats. If the cat's seeking out uh, the experience, it is probably improving the cat's health as well. But we don't have any data to show that that, that we lower a cat's blood pressure. But her work inside what's referred to as the lion's den at the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine is closer to improving heart health. We're, we're looking for the cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that's a type of cardiac disease that's very common in cats and also uh, common in humans as well. And one of its signs is the thickening of the left ventricle of the heart which is especially noteworthy this February during American Heart Month. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and cardiac disease is a very important disease in domestic cats. And then also we know that this disease occurs in humans too. Here at Missouri, we want to promote One Health and One Health includes helping our cats, having our cats help humans as well. And we know this is an important aspect of human health care. So here we see where our research on the domestic cat and studying the domestic cat's heart will help us understand human heart health as well. In humans, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is considered a leading cause of sudden cardiac death in younger people. It's estimated that one in every 500 people have the disease. Lyons is a Gilbreth McLaurin Endowed Professor of Comparative Medicine. The University of Missouri Feline Genetics and Comparative Medicine Lab is her research laboratory. This is where critical groundwork for the improvement of cat and human health is accomplished. Genetics of the cat translates very well to human genetics because we actually know that the genome arrangement of the cats, the genes on the chromosomes, is actually very, very similar to the organization that we find in humans. So we're hoping that important things like gene regulation that we find in the cats will also be translated to how genes are regulated in humans as well. And we use that to leverage being able to do translational medicine. So the research in Lyons Lab can lead to new standards for diagnosis and new treatments for this heart disease. We're trying to set standards of here's all the information that you would need to help prove that a DNA mutation that we find is pathogenic uh, for the actual disease that we're looking for. And so we happen to pick a bunch of heart disease mutations, and we're working through those now. And we'll be publishing on, here's what we think about the current disease mutations for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats. And this can have life-saving benefits for humans, too. Finding the gene, finding the mutation. So sometimes that helps us define undiagnosed patients that we find in humans. So not all the genes and mutations are known for HCM in cats or in humans. So when we find one in either species, we compare to see if we have found the same thing. And then certainly treatments that we might use in domestic cats may translate to treatments that we would use in humans and vice versa.
St. Louis is a world leader in cancer research. The first cancer genome ever sequenced anywhere in the world was done here. Local startups are playing a major role. If you just say, what are we working on in St. Louis? It's pretty much everything. Developing diagnostics and treatments, making strides right here in St. Louis. We can use that information to train the immune system on what they need to seek out and destroy wherever it is in the body. For the latest cancer research studies and clinical trials taking place in St. Louis, search the Cancer Research page at hecmedia.org. HEC Media, leaders in learning and education. Find the people and programs making a difference at hecmedia.org. I'm Marlon West from Walt Disney Animation Studios. I'm currently a visual effects supervisor, but most of my career has been spent doing special effects animation. I've always wanted to make films since I was like a little kid. And um, I, I got a movie camera for my 12th birthday, Super 8 camera, and tried to make films with my brother Tony and kids in the neighborhood. I always loved the work of Ray Harrahausen, who did all the Sinbad movies and Jason and the Argonauts. And all those are done in stop motion where you're actually a moving puppet, you know, one frame at a time. So what I started doing was using like the toys I had around the house to do like stop motion films. So as a result, my scale shrunk down, but my production value went up a lot higher because I had all these sweet costumes and vehicles for the G.I. Joe. And so my films got a lot richer looking because you can only get your hands on so much as a 12 year old. I mentioned Ray Harrahausen. His mentor was a guy Willis O'Brien and Willis O'Brien did all of the animation of King Kong. So somewhere in a book when I was a kid, I saw a picture of Willis O'Brien, you know, and he's got these armatures, these small scale creatures that looked like a job where a fella could bring his toys to work with him. And I was like, I need a job like that. I was working at a studio that did two animated films. They made a film called Rover Dangerfield and a film called Baby's Kids, which actually was a kind of little bit of a hit. I was effects animator on those. And when they stopped making features at that studio, it occurred to me that Disney would not stop making animated films super soon. So I applied there. They looked at my work, which wasn't great at the time. I thought it was pretty dope. And they offered me a trainee role. I wised up and saw it as a really great opportunity. So I started there as a trainee uh, during The Lion King, and I've been there ever since. Well, the Lion King was the first film that I worked on that people saw. That felt really good. Atlantis has kind of this comic book style, and that was the first time that I was actually a head of the department. That, that felt really good. They've all had been a gift of some sort. In animation, you don't, you're not pointing the camera at anything. Everything is being created by a computer or drawn or painted. As a visual effects supervisor, what I do all day is actually look at the works of animators or modelers or lighters or effects artists and make sure it's actually close to what I understand the director really wants and make sure it's actually helping support the visual storytelling. As an effects animator, what we do is kind of goes unseen you know, no one really kind of responds to like a dust cloud or or some debris falling. I've been fortunate to make a bunch of films like Frozen and Moana where effects are front and center. When you have a sister who's shooting snow and ice out of her hands, people notice those effects or water as a character. Uh, people tend to notice those. Last year, I was elected to the Board of Governors of the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences. It made me feel really great. The Board of Governors preserves what the Academy has done in the past. It looks to what we can do in the future. I'm part of the shorts and feature animation branch. So I try to represent the people that are short filmmakers and animation folks. It made me feel like people trying to trust in me to kind of have their voice. I like to actually make these films that people go see that means a lot to people that folks see as a child and maybe they'll see it again as an adult and they see it they'll show it to their kids and they'll show it to their grandkids there's very few films that people feel that way about animated features disney films in particular have that place in people's hearts as an artist and especially as an artist of color 
Um, I do like showing up for things just like this because no one sees animators. I like showing kids like myself that, oh damn, there's a, there's some black people that worked on that thing, you know? I like leading with some sort of open heartedness and kindness. I mean, my attitude, if you've been hired at Disney, you must be pretty good. So you don't need me to ride you. You need me to help give you an opportunity to, uh, to shine. And that's, what I, that's the kind of leader I try to be. Later on Spotlight, Grammy-winning blues legend Bobby Rush gives an impromptu performance. We are at the St. Louis Art Museum in the free exhibition Asho Oke, Prestige Cloth from Nigeria. The exhibition features hand-woven, strip-woven cloth from southwestern Nigeria made by Yoruba artists for Yoruba people to wear on celebratory and important occasions such as weddings, funerals, naming ceremonies, and other festive or ceremonial events. From a technical standpoint, this is strip-woven cloth, which means that the cloth is woven um, in strips about three to four inches wide and as long as the weaver wants to continue weaving. And so when we see a cloth in this gallery assembled for wearing, it really is constructed of strips placed side by side together and sewn along the sides or the selvages in order to form a cloth or a garment for wearing. So a special feature of this exhibition is the inclusion of a painting by the painter Nengi Omuku, who works in Lagos, Nigeria, and also in London. She has chosen as her canvas the Sanya type of Asho Oke. And in this painting here called Marloge, she celebrates cotton spinners in Senegal as a way of her continued way of thinking about fiber artists and weaving traditions in West Africa. The research is inconclusive about when Asha Oke began to be woven in southwestern Nigeria, but strip weaving in West Africa dates for centuries, centuries and centuries. There are archaeological examples of strip weaving found in Mali in West Africa that date to about 900. So we know that strip weaving is a very quintessential West African textile form. The oldest examples that we have on view here include one cloth that is comprised of palm fiber or raffia fibers, which is a very rare example. Most asho oke that you see in this gallery is made of silk or cotton. This exhibition features a primary color palette associated with asho oke, and that is sanya, which originally refers to tan, raw silk, alari, which refers to imported magenta-colored silk, and etu, which refers to indigo cloth. This exhibition features cloth from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. And because it focuses on this primary color palette, it's actually a very dated look at Asho Oke, but Asho Oke continues to be made and produced today. And there are many Nigerian Yoruba people in our community in St. Louis who I hope will visit the exhibition and maybe even come to the museum wearing 21st century Asho Oke, which is uh, even more vibrant and colorful than the presentation here. With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, 
experimental, or a classic. The arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. And the Grammy goes to All My Love For You, Bobby Rush. Let me tell you how much history in blues. Someone asked me, said, Bobby Rush, why do you sing the blues? Is it because your woman left you? And I often tell them, yes, you can have the blues when your woman leaves you, but you can also have the blues if they stay too long. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been mistreated by someone you're showing up love? Have you ever been mistreated by someone you're showing up love? Out of all of me and my woman could have left me far. She left me for the garbage man. No matter how bad she treated me, still can't get the love out of my mind, yeah. Oh, well, no matter how bad she treated me, still can't get the girl out of my mind. Out of all the men my woman could have left me for, she left me for the garbage man. If I ever get her to come back, I'm going to buy myself a garbage truck. If I ever get my woman to come back, Peter, I'm going to buy myself a garbage truck. When my garbage can't get full, Peter, I'm going to take it and drop it way, way out in the woods. That's the blues for you. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, preserving old technology for artists. See the oldest equipment they carry. Plus, exploring the American dream through a wide variety of materials at Laumeyer Sculpture Park. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.